Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Laura Hynek and I'm a member of the customer care team here at Vitech Corporation. I am very pleased to be your host for the webinar today as we discuss effective SE communication through models and representations. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to review a few technical details. First, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time via the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's event. We plan to respond to questions at the end of the webinar, so please keep them coming. We probably will not have time to respond to all questions, but, but, but we want to know what's going on with you today, so please, please fill, those, fill that out. Finally, recording. The webinar is being recorded today. If you are having te technical difficulties during the presentation, an online archive with this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live version. Okay, I believe that takes care of our housekeeping matters. Let's get started. I would like to take a moment to introduce David Long, our speaker for today's presentation. David founded Vitech Corporation in 1992 and continues to lead Vitech, the Vitech team delivering innovative, industry-leading solutions, helping organizations to develop and deploy next-generation systems. For over 20 years, David has focused on enabling, applying, and advancing MBSE to help transform the state of the systems engineering practice. He has played a key technical and management role in refining and extending MBSE to expand the analysis and communication toolkit available to systems practitioners. Please join me in welcoming President of Vitech Corporation, our speaker for today, David Long. Thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. In the era of document-centric systems engineering, communications was relatively easy. Or to be more precise, selecting the specific vehicle for communications was relatively easy. Choose the subject, be it requirements, interfaces, systems. Choose the corresponding template or standard, and you have the desired specification. Now communicating effectively, primarily in the written word through written spec was often complex and meaning was often lost, but the selection itself was, was relatively straightforward. As we move to model-based and model-centric approaches, the task is much more complex. We have a rich, diverse, often complex library of representations available to us, and making that communication choice is much more difficult today than it was in the past. Now, I'm tempted to start with the world's earliest systems representation, art from the cave walls showing man hunting woolly mammoth. I won't take us back quite that far, but some may still consider our starting point prehistoric. Here we go. So in the beginning, we had a very basic, relatively limited set of views back in the late 50s, early 60s. Classic views that we often still use today, hierarchies to show traceability and decomposition, uh, flow charts or flow block diagrams to show functional structure, state transition diagrams, data flow diagrams to, to complement those two dimensions, block diagrams, component diagrams, physical block diagrams, depending on your terminology, but something to show connectivity of our physical architecture and often some sort of tabular reference, traceability matrices, verification cross-references, etc. Now I'm trying not to use the S word here, uh, structured. We may use traditional or classic instead. Following that early phase, then we had a classic evolution stage. This tracked through the 70s, into the 80s and, and starting into the early 90s as well. And this was marked not by revolutionary change, but by small advances. We took the existing set. Uh, Bob Lano introduced the N-squared diagram for data exchange in, in 77. The IDEF representation, IDEF 0 heavily, but 1x3 came along in the 80s. Uh, function sequence diagrams followed by behavior diagrams and enhanced function flow diagrams came along. With the rise of software intensive systems, 
we then benefited from the insights and influences of UML. The ever-present use case diagram with the well-known stick figure showing actors helping us bridge between requirements and behavior. Uh, class diagrams to show structure, inheritance, a greater level of detail. The UML variant of a component diagram a little richer. Activity diagram, sequence diagram. So slowly, surely enriching our toolkit for communication. And next up came frameworks. DODAF, MODAF, TOGAF, TF, FIAF, seemingly anything that we could put in front of the letters AF became its own framework. At this point is when we started to reach some degree of confusion and overload. This is the point where frequently we saw teams subdivide and start shifting from engineering the system of interest to producing the representation demanded of them. So many remember the start of this era as the time when, when teams were fragmented and told, okay, you two go produce your OV1 for us, and, and you two over there, we want you to produce the SV1. And we started shifting again from the engineering of the system to the engineering of the architecture framework output. And now, today, we're dealing with the SysML revolution. Again, the use case diagram, parametric diagram, block definition diagram, internal block diagram, activity diagram, sequence diagram. At this point, we're still seeing some confusion, we're still seeing overload, but we're seeing something completely different than what we saw before, and that is a tension and a, a tug of war, a battle that's going on within our space. The discussions about representation have become far more dogmatic very reminiscent of the software language wars of the 80s. Oftentimes, people aren't discussing about what's best fit for purpose, what's best for the job at hand. It's more about, did you select the representation that I wanted you to? I think that's a dangerous time and a challenging time for our profession. I think we need not either or. I don't think it's structured or object. I don't think it's one or the other. I honestly believe it's both. We have a, a tough challenge ahead of us, and the richest representation set is what we need. And why do we need that rich representation set? Well, we serve rich domains, military aerospace, medical, energy. All the great problems of our age aren't technical problems, they're system problems. It's energy, transportation, clean water, limited resources. We've got diverse system life cycles, as short as the cell phone that you'll discard in a year, as long as the next generation Australian submarine that's 100 years from the first time pen is put to paper till the last sub is decommissioned. Part of systems engineering is just dealing with diverse groups, from systems engineers to software engineers, program managers, subject matter experts, users and stakeholders each with their own background, each with their own perspective, each with their own skill set. And then we have our specific needs. We need a toolbox, to, a toolbox that helps us analyze the problem at hand. We need a representation set that helps us present. And more than anything, we need tools that help us convince to explain what we've done, to explain why we're proposing what we're proposing, to draw out and elicit the input we need, and finally to instill confidence that we've done the right analysis and come up with the right solution so that we can move forward. This is a very demanding problem set from domain through audience through need. And again, only a rich representation toolkit will solve that need. So let's take a step back and talk about what is a view, what is a representation. Whether model-centric or document-centric, there's always been a model in play in systems engineering. The model is, it helps focus us on the aspects of interest. It serves as a limited approximation of the system of interest. But we always have to remember that the end goal is not the generation of that model. The end goal was never the generation of that specification. As Paul Logan of Australia, the president of uh, Systems Engineering of Society of Australia once reminded me, delivering the system itself isn't really our end goal. 
our end goal is delivering value to the customer via the system that we deliver. So we cannot be uh, decoyed by any step along the way. Where do views fit into this? Views simply provide us a window into the model. Or more specifically, many views provide us many perspectives, many insights into a very, very complex model. But why bother with views at all? If they are simply projections, why not use the model itself? Well, the first reason is, is simply complexity. If you go back to classic mechanical engineering, uh, early on in drafting, we were all taught that to do mechanical engineering, you need three perspectives. If you can draw the front, the top, and the side, well, you've got the full 3D representation. So now let's try to translate that to our domain. Perspectives, well, we've got a requirements perspective, a behavior perspective, a physical implementation perspective, a management perspective, a programmatic perspective, technical perspective, all on the same problem. Those aren't different problems, they're just different perspectives on a common underlying system. We've got different layers of detail. We could be talking at the highest level of detail, level one, our system. We could be talking uh, subsystem, we could be talking segment, we could be talking component. Level one through in, whatever you want to call them, but we've got a tremendous variety in the level of detail. And then we've got static and dynamic needs. So the bottom line here is we've got complex systems, we've got complex metal models, systems engineering itself is focused on bringing the interactions and the interrelationships to the surface, so much power is in the interfaces, and ultimately the problem at hand, our modeling, is complex. The representations, the views, the diagrams, the specifications themselves aren't just for viewing, they're not just for presenting, they're actually for constructing the model itself. Whether your underlying model is a uh, DARS model, underlying DODAF, whether it is exchanged through XMI as a underlying representation of SysML, or whether it's the specific schema you select on a Vitec uh, core or Genesis project, visualizing and constructing that model is complex. And so views, activity diagrams, sequence diagrams, n-squared diagrams, provide us an effective mechanism for building that, for analyzing it, for testing it, and yes, certainly for communicating it. So when you're dealing with complex systems, when you're dealing with multiple participants in the process, each with divergent needs, the DODAF concept a fit for purpose is really ideal here, and this is one of my favorite representations out of DODAF 2.0. It represents the interrelationships between models, information, and then driven from that information, specific views given specific presenta presentation techniques to address a specific need. Now these aren't divergent views drawn from divergent data sources. They're drawn from a common point through a rule set so that everybody is looking at and interacting with a common model through their given perspective. Ultimately, as I said, if you've got multiple participants with diverse needs, we need the richest set available. How do you choose among a very, very rich representation set? Well, most of us on this call are probably engineers. And so early in our education, we were taught that, well, as engineers, it's really all about us. That's one of the things that we have to forget or we have to move beyond when we think about what representations to use. Certainly, if I'm doing analysis and I'm, I'm just serving myself to understand the model and advance the model, I can pick whatever representation is most effective for the task at hand. I am my own customer. But if I'm trying to communicate and communicate effectively, we need to remember that it begins with the audience. We need to understand what their skill set is, what's their perspective, what's their background. For example, if I'm talking to a software-based audience, 
I'm probably not going to reach back and draw from classic structured system representations. Uh, more modern day object oriented system L representations are going to bridge any divide better. By the same token, unless uh, he has a special background or she has a special background, I'm not going to go into the Admiral's office and plop down a highly technical SysML diagram of the lowest level of detail. That's not going to be very effective communication either. So step one in choosing our representation set is understanding who the audience is. Step two is understanding what they need to see. They are part of this conversation for a reason. What is it that they're looking to get out? Are they looking for context? Are they looking for insight? Are they looking for confidence that the systems engineering team knows what, what they're doing? Only by meeting that need can we open their mind and open their ears to the message that we're trying to convey. So the third step is what it is that we want, what it is we need to tell them. Communication 101, think of it from the receiver's perspective. Only then think of it, think of our desires. Put bluntly, meet them where they are, bring them as far along as we can. So let's try to put that in practice a little bit. One of the richest places for systems representation is actually behavior. And if we go back, there was a classic paper that my father, Jim Long, published in the mid-90s titled Relationships Between Common Graphical Representations and Systems Engineering. Uh, for those interested, it's available in our website. Uh, Jim updated it at some point in the mid-noughts. It's not really a paper about the complete systems engineering domain. It's really about the behavioral domain. And in this paper, Jim noted that there is a spectrum, a continuum of representations. They aren't really divergent representations. You can plot them along this continuum. On one end, you have representations that are focused on control constructs. Uh, what's the sequencing of my functions? Are they occurring in parallel? Are they branching? Are there loops present, etc.? Nothing more, nothing less, but it's the flow of control, th control tokens through our execution. On the other end of the spectrum, it's more about interaction, it's more about message flow, it's more about triggering data, and it's not about that sequencing. Sequencing may be implied, but that's not what's heavily specified. And in the middle of that continuum, bridging the left and the right, are integrated representations, behavior diagrams, enhanced function flow block diagrams, activity diagrams. So these, this continuum represents composition, parent to child, control structuring, triggering, data flow, even allocation, swim lanes, for example. Now there's some misconception at times. This isn't at all about goodness or badness. Your position towards the end of a spectrum doesn't make you any better or any worse than a diagram that's in the middle of the spectrum. It's more about choosing the representation that fits the specific need. If I am trying to communicate what is the basic sequencing of events that occurs, much like we were first taught in flowcharting, well then I want a uh, an FFBD or equivalent so that it's not cluttered with other detail. If I want to talk with a user to understand what's the interaction that you're expecting to have between you and that ATM, I'm looking for messages and events to pass back and forth. Well, that's ideal for a sequence diagram. So lower amount of detail doesn't necessarily mean that it's a worse representation. Pick the representation fit for the specific need, the specific communication, the specific audience. And so let's take that a step further and look at specific behavioral views. The first behavioral view is the uh, operational view one from DODAF. Now I am a bit of a representational bigot and for a long time I thought it was all about technical detail, all about substance, not about style. Uh, I have changed my ways to say the least. If I were to introduce a new team member, a customer, anyone to a problem, I would want to start with what we traditionally call a cartoon. And cartoon doesn't mean it's bad. It's, it's just a representation technique that allows someone to approach the subject matter. 
In the case of the OV1, you see some lightweight composition. I see that in this environment, we initiate transactions, manage transactions, control access. You can draw triggering information, certainly the classic uh, tank firing a missile at another tank, well, that's a certain trigger. You can see allocation. But again, this is a low level of detail, highly contextual picture that helps keep us in scope. It aligns our system vision. Wonderful at the top levels. Wouldn't want it at a lower level in most cases. So now let's talk about that spectrum again or revisit that spectrum. On one end, we had the FFBD, a very low level of detail. It's great for a general audience. Most people at some point in their life were taught flow charting. Uh, wouldn't typically use it with a software engineer. A software engineer is going to seek a greater level of detail than an FFBD shows. All it shows is threads, sequencing, etc. And on the other end of that spectrum is that sequence diagram. Kind of a medium level of detail. Sequence diagrams are wonderful. They are accessible by a very, very wide audience. They're not perceived as technical even though they can have a lot of content. They do have a lightweight specification of the sequence. You can see the order things happen in, but you don't truly have the concepts of control. You do have allocation. That's what the lifelines are. You have the message passaging. Uh, I find these particularly valuable in that initial capture of scenarios or threads when you're looking at uh, those triggering aspects, my interaction with an ATM. They're very powerful tools when used to communicate with software engineers. I know teams that use this as their sole input. Now that worries me a little bit. I'd like to see them use richer representations that, that have other aspects so that those aren't lost, but it's a great communication tool across many divides. There are many other behavioral representations. The N-squared diagram I referenced earlier from Leno in 77, this is, again, a low level of detail. It's a very structured representation, much like design system matrix for those who are familiar with that technique. It shows the outputs along the horizontal, the inputs along the vertical, the functions along the diagonal, so that you can very quickly see interactions. You can also do clustering analysis if you're trying to, from an analytical point of view, determine what's my best clustering to minimize interfaces. You can also use this representation to highlight what's there and what's not there. This was used in the post 9-11 analysis to identify communications that they knew must have occurred or events that they knew must have happened, but they had not located yet. The IDEF0 shares a lot in common with the N-squared diagram. It's a much more detailed representation. Uh, inputs come in from the left, control or effectively triggers the top, outputs in the right, and mechanisms or effectively allocation on the bottom. It is still used by process engineers. It's not frequently used outside of that. It has some wonderful characteristics. It's wonderful from a debugging or diagnostic perspective because it shows boundary conditions at the labels. It shows, sorry, at the edges, it shows uh, tunneling so that you can see disconnects across levels of your system decomposition. But beyond educational use, we're seeing this one kind of fade out of practice. And then the state transition diagram. I don't personally use this one frequently, but there are many systems and many perspectives that uh, are best viewed from a state transition approach. It is orthogonal to behavior. It is looking at the same problem from an opposite perspective. Very, very frequently used by system and software engineers. Okay, So this is a case where looking at the transitions rather than looking at the functions gives you greater insight. Now let's go ahead and look at two of the most advanced and very, very similar. There's the enhanced FFBD and the activity diagram from SysML. And by the way, the activity diagram from SysML was cross-checked with the enhanced FFBD during its development to ensure that it would meet the needs of the systems engineer. These diagrams are the richest representation, the most complete representation of system behavior. They'll show you the control flow, the triggering, 
the data flow, the allocation. In the case of the EFFBD, it'll even show you the resource flow. The enhanced FFBD, for whatever reason, tends to be more accessible to a broader audience. And that's why I'll comment that I, I think it's very well used by everyone except for software engineers or SysML zealots. Watch out for dogmatic arguments. We've seen it happen when these views are used. But there's something about the representation. It may be the lack of the blocks and the greater than less than signs makes it appear more accessible to a general audience. Now, when talking with a system or software engineer who's well-versed in system L representations, the absolute richest representation is the activity diagram. You can specify ports. You can specify so much more if you want to get to that level of detail. It's a wonderful low-level design view. But again, think of your analytical need if you're doing analysis. Think of your customer's need if you're presenting. Think of the audience. And then one dynamic view is a simulation timeline. Other dynamic views would be animations driven through satellite toolkit. Here we're looking to understand the true performance aspects of the system. Where are the live locks? Where are the dead locks? What's my resource demand? What's my throughput? What's my timing? Okay, it's the only dynamic representation or set of representations we have here. So that's the behavioral side. How about the component side? Well, we don't have quite as rich a set on this side, but we do still have uh, a couple dimensions to deal with. On one end of the dimension, we have composition, often multi-level parts diagram, or sorry, parts trees, etc. On the other end of that spectrum, that con con sorry, that continuum is more about connectivity. You may go multi-level, not too far, but you're focused more on the interconnections. You also start to see a stratification of diagrams based upon what level you're at. Is it a high-level concept that you're trying to uh, present, or is it a low-level design view? And then we also have the inheritance concept, uh, the classic class diagram out of UML that has influenced us. So taking it to the next level, again, we start with a view from DODAF, a cartoon, a very, very powerful cartoon. Here's a... SV1 from World War I. This is actually uh, representing and drawn by a uh, cohort of our Vice President of Engineering, our Vice President of Services. His grandfather, coming back from World War I, had this cartoon drawn. And you can see very quickly what the composition of this system is, what the interfaces are, uh, some of the key system boundaries. It's a very, very powerful view. Just as the operational view one, the OV1, is a high-level functional context, the SV1 is the first physical context that I would expose a team member or a customer to. Going back to the classic hierarchy, whether you're a systems engineer or, or almost anyone else, a physical hierarchy, a traceability hierarchy, they always present very well. Low level of detail, it's all composition, uh, typically, in-depth hierarchies, parts lists, etc. Nothing fancy. Now, the system L variants that hierarchy have far more detail. If you're looking to communicate what role something uh, something plays within a hierarchy, if you're looking to understand operations and values, the system L representation it's a more technical notation but it demonstrates that. There's another variant of the block definition diagram, which we call the classification block definition diagram, which is the UML class diagram. It's more about inheritance. If you have a common camera, you can have a wired camera, and you can have a wireless camera. If you have a specific radar, or sorry, a type of radar, you can have one installation in Arizona and one installation in Maine. Again, we're highly in, into composition or inheritance. How about connectivity? Well, the highest level connectivity view that we would use would be a physical n-squared diagram, much like the logical view. Here we're dealing with the components on the diagonal. We're dealing with either logical interfaces or physical connections on the off-diagonals. Not a very detailed diagram, 
easily accessible, but not very detailed. And so as you get more detailed, the next level would be the classic systems engineering block diagrams, the interface block or the physical block diagrams, focused again on what are those logical connections, what are those physical cables, uh, environments, et cetera, that connect me. And then at the lowest level of detail would be the internal block diagram, which goes to a next level. Uh, what are the ports? What are the interface specifications? What is the directionality? What is the data that is being carried across, the, across that connection? So you can see on a stratification how we can go from a level zero high level diagram to a mid-level down to a detailed level. Again, always keeping in mind the needs of the audience when we select that. How about requirements? We're not going to try to hit every type of diagram through this, but it's good to sample them at least. So in the requirements views, uh, SysML introduced the requirements diagram, a modified hierarchy that has specific semantics for composition, derived requirements, specification, verification. To be honest with you, this is a bit of a toy representation. They don't scale very well. It gives you good picture and good context for a very, very limited set of requirements, but not much more than that. The more classic representation is the hierarchy diagram, whether it is decomposition of requirements, whether it is traceability of requirements, presented vertically, horizontally, it, it really doesn't matter. These are still the classic representation, but the most used of all is, of course, the tabular view. So many people still deal with requirements tables, whether they're in Word or in Excel or et cetera. It could be a table of requirements and their specific properties. It could be a traceability matrix. It could be a verification matrix. These are very, very rich representations. Uh, very, very accessible at the same time. People tend to be able to absorb tabular data and matrix data very, very well. A few additional representations to talk about. Well, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't at least mention the use case diagram. So many people now do represent or do uh, expect and understand that stick figure, that actor. These are good representations to help elicit early knowledge from users to help communicate some early information about the primary use cases. They're a great bridge from the requirements phase to the early threads. They're a great place to capture preconditions and postconditions so that we've got the context as we transition and elaborate into sequence diagrams, activity diagrams, enhanced function flow blocks, and fully specify our behavior. One of the best contributions, in my opinion, of SysML is the parametric diagram, the opportunity to visualize and mathematically model the key mathematical specifications of interest that are going to drive our system. These are particularly powerful and particularly dangerous. So often those words come together. It is easy to get drawn down into component level engineering when you still need to be working at the system level, but it is an opportunity to specify and model critical constraint equation, cr critical physical equations at the system level. Spider diagrams or generic object diagrams, these are very low level detail but very general audience diagrams. There's no implied semantic in these diagrams. They're all about context. They're all about uh, helping pieces fit together and communicating where pieces fit within the greater picture. And then best of all, uh, from a fit for purpose view, is actually dashboards. These are the fusion views envisioned in DODAF 2.0. Single page focused illustrations for a project manager. It could be cost, schedule, critical risks, open issues. For a test manager, it could be test case status, uh, open tests, pending tests, etc. But in one view, often with drill down capability, that high level fusion insight 
into the very, very complex underlying system model and system status. Everything that I cited there on project manager and test manager was more about status than model, but the concepts are parallel. In any case, what is absolutely critical is that this be a consistent view of views. Views have to be that projection of the underlying model. They must be the fit for purpose concept out of DODAF 2.0. They must serve to construct, to analyze, to communicate, to convince. They must be a means to an end, not an end unto themselves. And therein is our trap as we move forward as a profession. As we enrich our toolbox, as we have richer and richer representations to serve more complex problems, to communicate more effectively with stakeholders, to interface more, connect more effectively ourselves, we run the risk of serving those representations rather than those representations serving us. Diagram-based systems engineering is a very real danger and a very dangerous decoy. It's a very easy trap to fall into much as so many fell into in the early days of C4ISR and DODAF. Diagrams and documentation, which is just a t more formal, more detailed representation of that underlying system, must be the representational tools that enable MBSE. We can't make them the substitutes. Remember, they're not a journey unto themselves. Our ultimate goal is to deliver the model, to deliver the system, to ultimately deliver the value to our customers. To do that, I think we need the richest representation set possible, always keeping in mind the needs of the audience first, their background, their desires, and then picking the tools, the representations from the vast collection available to meet their needs. Thank you, and Laura, I'm going to turn it back over to you for questions here. Thank you, David. We'd like to move now to your questions. We've already received some great questions. Thank you for submitting those. I encourage you to join the discussion and submit your questions at any time via the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar, in the GoToWebinar window. Let's get started. A question here from John. He asks, with the proliferation of views, wouldn't we be better off to focus on a narrower set of choices and use the basic views? It's a great question, John. It's, it's almost like the vocabulary in the dictionary. We each end up ultimately choosing a subset that serves us very well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't frequently use the state transition representation. That's not one that I, I default to. But even though we will choose a limited subset, we need a richer language. So often we want that more complex word to communicate a concept that the more basic words that are in our library don't do. We need that specialty representation that communicates with a specific stakeholder or highlights a specific area. For example, that N-squared diagram, great clustering analysis tool, may not be used very widely beyond that. So the best choice, draw from that representation toolbox that exists. Pick the subset that naturally works for you, but don't forget the others that are there and when to use them. Thank you, David. We have a second question from Ken. Ken asks, what view or views are best? Well, that's, uh, that's back, Ken, to the spectrum discussion in the behavioral representations graph that I mentioned uh, that my father, Jim Long, put together. It's like deciding which golf club is best. It's all about the situation. If you're at the tee, you want the driver. If you're in the sand, as some of us so often are, you want the sand wedge. If you're on the green, well, you're going to want the, the putter. And so it all depends. Understand what the strength and the weakness of each view is, because they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. And, and pick the set that best meets, again, 
what does your audience understand what is their background what is it that you're trying to what is it that they need communicated and then what are you trying to communicate with them Thank you, David. Uh, we have another question from Jim. Jim asks, can you comment further on the difference between the EFFBD and the activity diagram? They look almost identical. Good question, Jim. At the simplest level, they are identical. It has far more to do with representational differences than anything else. Uh, the EFFBD will represent a trigger with a double arrowhead. The activity diagram will represent a trigger as an arrowhead without the without the label uh, optional on top of it but at the next level down there is more technical detail present in an activity diagram as I mentioned you can specify ports for example that give a greater level of specification design level specification on how items connect into activities on the uh, EFFBD, you can specify resources so you can see that dimension of the behavioral model. So the two that were shown were very, very similar. And in fact, as they are often practiced at the system level, which I would call EFFBD light and SysML light, they're equivalent. It's just a notational difference. But if you want to burrow deep down, you can get some slight technical differences the, the activity diagram from SysML ultimately having the greatest design power. Thank you, David. That wraps up the Q&A for today. If we weren't able to answer your question during the Q&A portion of the presentation, we will contact you directly after the webinar to ensure that your question is answered. If you have other questions or comments that you didn't send in today, we invite you to post those on the forum of our community site. You'll find that at community.vitechcorp.com. A recording of today's webinar will be posted to our website, vitechcorp.com, by the close of business tomorrow. We would also like to personally invite you all to join us on Thursday, May 10th at 4 p.m. Eastern for a special presentation titled Document the Model, Don't Model the Document by Dr. David Har Harvey of Aerospace Concepts. In closing, I would like to thank our presenter today. I'd especially like to thank all of you for your questions today. As we bring this webinar to a close, a survey will open on your screen either in a new web browser tab or in a new window. Please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's presentation and what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day.